So wording along the lines of economically viable make me pretty nervous. Um, when Laura first asked me to speak, um, she kind of presented a, a suggested topic somewhere along those lines, and I was a little bit squeamish. I was almost expecting her to ask for my T4 statements, but she didn't, and uh, so here I, here I am. Um, so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about our farm, but also about grain milling and small-scale production and kind of direct farm marketing a little bit in kind of more general senses. Um, Consider the simple carrot. For nearly 5,000 years, carrots have been grown on small farms and backyard gardens. For thousands of years, people have pulled carrots out of the dirt, washed off the grime, chopped them up for stewing pots. Done. Consider the stalk of wheat. For thousands of years, they have been planted, tended, weeded, cut down, and then agonized over. What to do with the mess of straw and hulls and insects and dust and, and chaff that results and the few small specks of something edible when you grow a field of grain. Grain milling is an area of food production where each degree of technology makes huge leaps forward in the quality and the quantity of food that we can have available. If I take a handful of oat straw from our farm, it is a huge undertaking to thresh and winnow and sort and dehull and roll that handful of oats into porridge flakes. I often bring a home grain milling setup to kids' events, as much as babysitting is for anything, and parents are always grateful for the excess, for all of their kids' excess energy. The work involved in milling grains by hand is almost certainly more than the energy that we can get back from a bowl full of porridge. But social historians suggest that because grain milling is so difficult, it was for thousands of years a community builder, one of the factors that led to human settlements in dense population patterns. As centuries passed, neighbors pooled together the resor their resources to create infrastructure. Now I need to figure out the clicker. So they, uh, to overcome the difficulties of grain milling, community threshing floors were built, like this one here in, uh, in Greece. Uh, after threshing floors, uh, later in the 1700s, we had, uh, so the early threshing floors were just depressions in the ground lined with stone that everyone from the community could come to, to winnow their grain. Later on, we built specialized buildings with slotted floors for animals to trot on the grain, and a lot of effort has been put into reducing the tedious job of separating grain from plant material. Next came mills and grindstones powered by livestock, by water, by wind, and eventually electricity. The difficulty of grain milling became a central reason for homes to be located within walking distance of each other, and for neighbors to work out their differences and invest in common infrastructure. Grain was proof that the efforts of the collective could be exponentially better than the efforts of the individual. And yet this incredibly useful concept of mechanization has been taken to such an extreme that there are now only a few small number of processors for each crop in all of Canada, leaving the milling equivalent of food deserts in the middle of the grain growing prairies. As farmers, few of us ever directly see the end result of our work, the food product that comes from our fields. In Manitoba, we have 11 million acres of cropland. But when I go to, to a Sobeys or a, or a superstore, I see a huge warehouse full of, filled with food and a very small ender that might be their local products, a very, very small portion of what's in the store. Most of what we eat has been cleaned, milled, packaged, brokered, rebrokered, distributed, sold to warehouses, back to retailers, back to more warehouses across the continent and sometimes across the world before it comes to our tables. And yet, we as farmers are faced with a growing environment, environmental necessity of lowering our carbon imprint, of reducing food miles, and helping to create sustainable food systems. Most people don't even know where to start. Just a few months ago, I was filling my shopping cart with fruits and vegetables, and I overheard a customer take one of the grocery clerks aside. She was very sincerely imploring this clerk grocery clerk that she really enjoyed buying local products and she was disappointed that the store hadn't made any efforts to stock Manitoba avocados. <laughs> of course, eating local can be taken too far. I also remember speaking with an elderly Italian gentleman who was telling me about roasting oats to use as a coffee substitute in World War II. Now, I'm not here to tell you to give up oats in exchange for a steaming mug of oat water. But we do grow amazing food here in Manitoba, and a lot of that food goes unknown, unvalued, and underdepreciated here in the province where it's grown. Go back here. 
When we first started to start farming about eight years ago, we were enticed by the simple concepts of tending to things that grow. Dirt, water, sunlight, plants pushing up through the soil after the first spring rain. We were inspired by concepts of voluntary simplicity, of choosing less in order to live fuller lives, of waiting for spring to eat asparagus, of stirring oats into a pot and letting them simmer, rather than digging into a bowl of cereal in order to cram as much as possible into every minute of each day. But we also saw gaps in what was available in Manitoba, and we wanted locally grown organic food to be more available, even from the really selfish perspective of just wanting that food for ourselves. Oats seemed like the most logical place to start, as it's the product that we most wanted to see on grocery shelves and in our own pantry. Also, it was about the only thing that we could imagine growing on the rocky soil of our own farm in the West Interlake. My daughter recently has been doing research about the settlement that used to exist in one of our back fields. There are stories of the settlers in that area who would hang their laundry nine feet off the ground so that the malnourished cows grazing on the pasture wouldn't eat their clothing as it dried in the sun. They were so desperate for any possible shred of nutrition that they might get from the cotton cloth of their clothing. We don't exactly farm in a region overflowing with milk and honey. So we planted a few fields of naked or hullless oats. And after assessing that oats could reasonably compete with the boulders and the sloughs of our fields, we started to set up our own mill. We spent the next four years compiling a reasonably functional grain mill. We chose naked oats because we were intrigued by the nutritional and the taste difference, and also because of the functional advantage of not needing to dehull them or heat process them. Also by the ecological uh, impact of not having to uh, add so much energy in the heat processing uh, was also a significant factor. Over time, we acquired old pieces of seed cleaning and milling equipment from auction marts. Sometimes we were the only one raising our hands and bidding against the scrap metal dealer, so we knew that we were a shoe in We had also scraped the bottom of our bank accounts to invest in technology like an optical sorter for our grain milling. And we have poured in elbow grease, designing and building some of the equipment ourselves, because we couldn't afford to buy the milling equipment that we needed, or because what was available wouldn't quite fit our scale or our specific needs. We now clean, mill, and package our oat products in a reasonably time-efficient way. Well, compared to how we started anyways, where we were bucketing grain from each piece of equipment into the next and giving a final quality control sort by hand, calling my mum in tears every time I had a large order to fill. Even now, large-scale mills might process as many oats in a few days as we do in a full year. But having one boot in the farming world and the other boot in the consumer world means that we think of scale really differently. I tend not to think in terms of acres or bushels or commodity prices, but rather in the micro, the smallest common denominator, the bowlful, the spoonful even. Over the past eight years of farming, we have grown just 400 acres of oats, spread over eight years. It's a very small and manageable entity. You know, maybe a week or so to plant and a few days to harvest if you were to lump it all together into one year. But it comes out to 4,088,000 bowls of, of oatmeal. Each package is packed and sealed by hand, delivered to the store, arranged on the shelf, and sometimes it even involves emails with consumers to talk about a favorite recipe, a personal health journey with diabetes or celiac disease, or photos shared of a toddler tossing their oatmeal on the floor. If on-farm processing is something that appeals to you, I would suggest that it can be really, really rewarding. In addition to learning how to drive tractors, maintain and rebuild machinery, weld, troubleshoot electrical problems, do soil testing, all the normal to farm stuff, I have spent at least an equal amount of time and energy building an e-commerce platform for our website, interpreting retail lingo, designing packaging and promotional material, developing food safety protocols and a HACCP plan, communicating with customers, and of course, navigating the strange, strange world of Instagram. Running a business with such a varied to-do list, and sorry, I just put it up here now, uh, means that although I never really get good at anything that I do, no day is ever boring. It also has some significant advantages for trying to adapt a work schedule to the needs of my family. Accounting and emails and graphic design work during the toddler's afternoon nap, machinery maintenance when the kids are playing outside, and always lots of fighting over who gets to push the trolley when we deliver oats to stores. We're a little bit of a scene when we show up at the back of a Sobeys with three kids in tow. But after about two years of milling, no, sorry, about two years ago, so about six years into our milling journey, we had reached a point where we felt like we were getting close to saturating the organic and specialty oat market in Manitoba. We were paying the bills and had an employee hired to help with milling and packaging, but not really enough left over to live off of, unless we ate oatmeal three meals a day and took vacations in our back fields. 
It felt that any significant gains in sales could only be achieved with reducing our prices to compete with conventional oats, which would, of course, require that we jump onto that dreadful treadmill of economy of scale, where the equation is something like, if we just sell more quantity, then we can charge less per pound, and then we'll sell a little bit more, and somehow maybe we'll pay the bills in the end. We started to expand our geographic reach, selling oats to distributors in Saskatch Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. But the cold realities of competing for shelf space and the race to the bottom economics of trying to sell a product were less than appealing. It's not what we'd started farming in order to do. At one point, we doubled down and kept our mill running for 16-hour days to fulfill a truckload order of 40,000 pounds for a food processor on Ontario. But we quickly lost interest in supplying that sector. Watching the semi-truck pull out of the farmyard loaded up with tote bags of our oats gave us no more satisfaction than dropping off a 20-pound bag in a Winnipeg cafe. We had a seed cleaning facility and a mill that was only being used a few days a week. And we had a desire to provide food for the communities around us, but it felt like we'd hit a ceiling. We spent time navel gazing and number crunching, thinking about what we wanted to achieve with our farm and the type of business that we wanted to become. We knew that we didn't want to be a large scale, normal oat processor. We didn't want to make decisions based on the economics of supply chains, but we did want to make a living from what we were doing. We wanted to be providing food in an authentic and personal way. Finally, we took a risk and decided to shrink inwards rather than to grow outward. For years, I had been dreaming of dividing up a field and testing out just a few acres of as many different types of crops as I could think of to test out what else we might be able to grow on this farm where the cows eat laundry. But you should know that most of my farm experiments ended tragically. The row of amaranth that I planted along the edge of the oat field was swathed along with our oats two or three weeks before they were ready to harvest. Even the shelter belt of evergreen trees that I planted on the side of another field, they were also cut down with the hay vine. Actually, two years in a row. My mother-in-law thought that the flagging tape was a little bit strange as she drove over it. Two years in a row. But I had started to recall stories that I heard from some of the grain farmers that I knew. Those were stories about crops that couldn't be sold into the conventional market, often simply because the quantity wasn't quite right. This might be the leftovers in a bin after loading a truck, or in situations where a processor was too far away and transportation logistics became an insurmountable hurdle when the harvested crop didn't quite fill a truck. Usually those leftovers were perfect food, but somehow it became this strange category of on-farm food loss. I did a little bit of research and found that by the numbers, a half to a third of all food harvested never gets eaten. Numbers are a little bit fuzzy here. Does an apple core count as food waste? What if, you turn, uh, what if you ferment that apple corn and turn it into apple cider vinegar? Um, so it gets a little, bit, uh, a little bit fuzzy. But specifics aside, 10% of that food, of that food loss, is food that never makes it off the farm. I wasn't sure if that also applied equally to the grain milling world, so I wanted to find out. I started to wonder if I could provide people with a variety of local grown organic grains, pulses, seeds, and flowers by leveraging small scale and local to fill the gap that's left by a food system that's gigantic and global in scale. So I opened up the organic farm directory and I cold called three different farmers that I didn't know personally. After I talked to them, I found that there was indeed such a thing as on-farm food loss in the grain world. And tragically, it seemed to most uh, drastically affect the farmers who were the smallest and often the people who were most, most committed to experimentation, people who are taking risks with intercropping or trying out something new because they were doing something that they believed would be best for their land, regardless of the market conditions for selling that particular crop. So the next step, I took those miscellaneous leftovers to our farm where I could do the processing in our mill. The first time I processed flax, it took about two weeks, a load of flax that probably would have taken a conventional oat processor half a day to do. But we're learning. The next step was trying to find a market. We sell most of our oats through conventional retailers like health food stores like Sobeys, Safeways, and co-ops but packaging can usually only be printed in batches of 10,000 or more, and it takes months to develop and print. If you're not Kellogg's or Kraft, it's hard to get the attention of the retail world. It can take years to get a product listed and put on the store shelf. So I knew that the retail system wasn't well suited to a limited supply of small batch grains. Instead, I decided to bypass distribution, packaging, and retailers, and sell direct to consumers. I set up an online store through my website where consumers could purchase grain bundles of various sizes, each grain bundle made, being made up of a variety of Manitoba organic grains. I've kept it really simple. You can't choose what's in your bundle, you just choose a size, small, medium, or large. A full share is about 80 pounds of, of organic food, but the consumer doesn't have a say in which, uh, which products are included. Similar to a CSA box from a vegetable farm, 
you will probably get more zucchini than you know what to do with, and you might not really like parsnips, but you have to deal with what you get. Naturally, I started with oats, and then I included other products that I knew were being produced by other organic farmers around the province. Quinoa and yellow peas from Tamarack Farms, sunflower oil from Plowshares Farm, spelt and emmer flour from Dan and Fran de Rook, camelina oil and sprouting seeds from Freefield Organics, and then I rounded out those bundles with the grains that I had found from other farmers and that I'd cleaned in my own mill. French green lentils, black beans, flax, and this year as well, soybeans, black beluga lentils, desi chickpeas, and cornmeal. I even cleaned lamb's quarter and force-fed it to some other customers as well. Starting something new is always a risk, and I thought for a while that I'd be eating black beans every meal until the day I died, although with news reports of empty grocery shelves and hysteria buying of toilet paper, a few thousand pounds of lentils and black beans on hand does give you a pretty smug feeling. So I set one single pickup day for a Winnipeg location in the middle of winter, after I'd had time to round up the crops and clean them and sell shares. The first year, January of 2019, I wasn't sure how it would work, but I suggested that anyone who brought their own containers would get a double portion of oats. It worked out reasonably well, and 90% of people brought their own containers, creating a zero-waste food supply. Um, this past January, we had 300 people getting their winter supply of 18 different types of grains, pulses, oil, and flour which amounts to 25,000 pounds of organic food heading straight to people's tables, bypassing retail distribution and transportation. Um, it was a little bit of a wonderful and a little bit of a crazy day. Some of the customers led informal workshops demonstrating their favorite recipes or food preparation techniques, and a lot of the farmers who grew the crops helped to scoop out grain and fill customers' containers. A lot of people came with preconceived notions about crops like soybeans, thinking that it was a, a crop directly tied to the deforestation of the Amazon. But after talking to the farmer who grew soybeans and talking about why it was a helpful crop for him to build healthy rotation on his farm, our Facebook group is alive with recipes for chocolate, soybean hummus, soy milk lattes, and soybean chili. Now, I know that in the grand scheme of things, an initiative like this is a tiny drop in the bucket when it comes to food production. I'm not suggesting that a model like this could or should replace larger scale food systems, but it seems like it's a small thing that's making a difference. It's 25,000 pounds that might otherwise be downgraded to animal feed and that doesn't have to be shipped back and forth across the country. It's 25,000 pounds that's not wrapped in multiple layers of plastic packaging, and it's 300 families that are choosing to eat, first and foremost, what's grown here in Manitoba. And oh yeah. So I also wanted to encourage anyone who wanted to, who has something that they thought, thought would fit into this model to come and talk to me, either asking questions now or finding me throughout the day, because I am looking to find organic crops from other farmers that have these small amounts of leftovers, or if you're someone who is considering doing on-farm processing yourself. I think that the CSA model could be a really helpful venue for someone to try out processing and to develop a product without having to worry about the packaging and retail and customer relations that go along with it. So we're looking for other farmers to contribute to our project and help to make it something that grows in Manitoba.